movement developing, and here's, here's the melancholy part, uh, developing a, a vision of death and afterlife and the extension of something beyond uh, the mortal can of the body of the, of the poet into some future, to, that Hikmet imagines some future life. And he does this, he draws upon, if I understand, uh, from his experience of social death in, in prison and from the varieties of unhappiness in his own life, he fashions, uh, he, he's thinking of his mortality. And it struck me that as an American poet, uh, that this, it seemed, seemed uncannily like Whitman to me. That is, and particularly uh, two things. One is the way Whitman now derives his vision of futurity and of immortality kind of arising out of in, in, irreconcilable social differences in, in other words, the emerging civil war in the 1850s, right? Politics can't fix it. Uh, Whitman, at a certain point, writes Song of Myself as an alternative vision to the Constitution, to, uh, and, and, and writes his work as an American Bible. I don't think he's got 2,000 pages, but I bet he's got 1,500. <laughs> and he actually wrote his work to be a Bible. He wanted to have 365 sections so he could read one every day. Uh, but the important thing was that, that, that he imagines uh, a future life for those who want it. Right? He says, look for me under your boot soles. He says in Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, uh, in, in one, of the, one of the most sublime moments of that poem, he says, I already, readers a hundred years from now, I already, I see you now. And I'm writing this poem not for my own time, not even for my own death, but for a hundred years after my death when you will be crossing this ferry and I will be there with you. Now, he has a very elaborate vision of, of, of the way poet, the poet's life can extend to the future, but it struck me that in, in Hikmet's case, that there was something being offered there in some of the poems, even that, we, that you quoted, that is, and I was curious about what, uh, you know, with Whitman, he clearly thought of himself as a quasi-religious figure. I understand that that, that that may not be Hickmet's jam, as it were. But it does seem like there's a, is, I'm curious about that vision of what life is offered to readers in the future. How did Hickmet imagine future readers? We could see, hear a note of solidarity there, and love and life and thought are kind of offered to people. But it struck me as that that was a very fertile, uh, and resonant connection between those two poets. And I wanted, you know, thinking about a kind of Whitmanic uh, vibration, possibly, within Hikmet, whether you might say more about how that, you know, about that imagining of futurity in Hikmet. Because, I, I mean, you, you laid it out so beautifully, and, and, and it just seemed like, oh, well, I just want to hear more about it. But if, unless we can't bear the truth and you want to hold on. <laughs> Or anybody. Yeah. That's Jimmy Hendrix checking. I was gonna actually ask Jill to jump in there now that we're on this. Or if anyone else wants yeah. to speak about this in yeah, wider terms of literature. I think, well, the thing that first comes to mind, I mean, I think it's a great uh, insight, and I think it would be productive to, to consider afterlife as sort of formulated in Whitman and formulated in, in Hickman and see their, their similarities and differences. Um, I think well, one answer is, is this idea of what reading is. Um, I think, uh, very smart Turkish German scholar has written about um, in one of the novels of, of the Turkish German um, writer Emine Sevgi Özdemar, um, Hikmet um, sort of comes to, uh, 
pretty much comes to life, like uh, he and many other leftists, as she sees herself sort of becoming, entering into this community of leftists. Um, for her, they, uh, like, hidden in the pages, or in the pages of these used books she has, are like eyelashes and fingernail clippings and all these sort of, like, you know, pieces of people who have read them. Um, and for her, that's, um, that's the relationship with the, uh, with the poet as well, particularly with Hikmat, who is her sort of greatest inspiration. Um, but yeah, it's this idea of sort of uh, yeah, an explicitly secular afterlife, I would say, that that has to do with uh, with, with being remembered and being um, thought of. Like I think that in his poems, he often talks about living in minds, and I think that you see that uh, in lots of references to him. The idea that like in in the news, sometimes these clippings that I would get would say, uh, you know, uh, Hickman's alive. Hickman is still living. Like happy birthday, Hickman. Like there's the pond, like, and you see it sometimes also sort of too like putting the the, the 38 when he you know as sort of died in 1938. So they put the eight sideways to make, instead make like an eternity sign. Um, and I would say that a lot of that discourse is reflected in the way Hickman Hickman's afterlife is is perpetuated and refashioned. It's, it's an insistence on the idea that he is alive in some way. The beginning. You, you know that this question of afterlife and culture and legacy, one of the most ironic things about Hikmet is that the present Erdogan government is trying to recreate both the images of Hikmet and Atatürk. Okay. For example, Hikmet has become, he emphasizes, in the Erdogan vision, as a nationalist. Okay. There are nationalist poems in the human landscape. As a matter of fact, Atatürk in one of his kind of resonance pieces, that famous painting of, photograph of Atatürk kind of he recreates that image up on a hill and joins this completely with the rules of the whole landscape of the geography, of the name of villages. In, the, in, in that sequence, the name of the villages is a very intimate, long and flowing names with kind of strange meanings embedded in each one of them. It becomes an incredible part of the poem. And then I think I will also push a little bit back that Probably in Hikmet there is no religious, I mean there is no sectarian religious, there's no question about it. But his longing for the earth of Islam, Turkey, that he wants to put in his grave, is back actually a kind of semi-religious spiritual desire. He wants to become in his afterlife, not only as a reputation, but he wants to become part of the earth, you know, Turkish earth. Which makes him both a nationalist, but you know, you make the distinction between millet, millet, you know, and uh, and country. You know, this is this idea of millet uh, is very important to understand the kind of resonances that uh, that Hikmet has, and unfortunately, if you do not know Turkish, you miss this. Basically. You see, you don't see this. You kind of basically see it from this east-west ideological background. And uh, in my opinion, that, though, that makes him a very potent, iconic figure, culturally. Okay. But misses a lot of really kind of profound experience of Nazi Ukraine as a politics. In the interest of time, I want to see if there's questions out of the audience. I, I just wanted to quickly add that in that poem, it's interesting, I have to follow up on what I was saying, that um, he doesn't refer to Usturk by name, he, he calls him a blonde wolf. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting, I mean, I think he's very conscious of the, the, the sort of the, the ideological fine line that he's walking, and, and he, go, he, re, he resorts to metaphor there, um, I think to not alienate part, part, of, part of his audience in what would otherwise be an extremely nationalistic. Everybody knows who he is. Everyone knows who the blonde wolf is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everyone would have the comb over wolf. 
Well, as far as uh, landscapes of the, the body and, and landscapes of the earth, it's, you know, it, it's, I don't know the poetry well, but are most of the uh, references to the earth very specific? Because when I think of, about uh, transcendence of, of rivers and mountains that don't respect their, you know, their eternal, yet they aren't fixed to a place, they they, they cross borders. And I, I don't know if if if if he if he, if he uses those in a more uh, uh, trans transcending, or whether it's usually all localized. I, mean, I, I would I would say he, he, he uses them in a transcending way. I mean, not not just the idea that there is that there's the natural environment, but that humanity is a landscape, right? I mean, the human landscapes. The title of that of that is magnum opus. But in, in a famous uh, other another famous epic poem, um, the, the the epic of Sheikh Bedr Din, he talks about that the earth uh, the earth was was and I'm going to misquote it, but the earth was on the verge of giving birth. The, the earth was about to give birth. I mean, you know, so he, so he's coming back to, to the landscape, to, to humanity as a mass as kind of forming part of that landscape, and yeah, and then he's he's uh, he's dissolving board, you know, these borders completely. Um, the, the geopolitical borders dissolve. And then... try to write to Atatürk because when he was the Navy trial was going on, Atatürk was still alive and he was very ill, yeah. um, and he never, yeah, he never did um, hear back. So it's sort of I think that's a a, a resonant uh, an ongoing question, you know, what what he did think, but I don't know what he would think. Somebody else answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, stri strictly speaking, ideologically, you know, these are. Uh, People coming from from different perspectives, ideologically. So, I, I think that. Uh, but it, maybe I can get out of this question by saying, <laughs> by saying, if we think of this a little bit like a Venn diagram, you know, that there, I think there are there are moments, there are points of uh, commonality and mutual, probably kind of mutual uh, um, respect or understanding. But um, there are also areas in which they would they would completely disagree. Uh, I think. So. Well, I don't think um, that you can espouse a kind of vision of nationalism as well as international socialism at the same time. I mean, you could say that one is a stage to the other, which I think that Hikmet would, would probably lean toward. But um, I don't think you would have um, Ataturk espousing that internationalism in the same way. I mean, you know, he was very opposed to any kind of international interference. Um, you know, in the in the country and in the country's politics, uh, ideologically, or even going back to uh, you know be right before the republic was established, the this movement in India, you know, the Khilafat movement, which led to the abolishment of the Caliphates, and all of that, you know, the, the a lot of the rationale that was given is that there was too much international interference in Turkish domestic politics. And maybe after it was, uh, I mean, maybe more spiritual than after. Well, it's, what's interesting to me, coming back to this idea of, you know, there isn't religion in the traditional sense here, but there are the forms and structures of religion in both cases. I mean, there is a kind of prophet in both cases. Uh, they are both, um, in some in some ways, cast in that in that in that way. Um, they have this eternal. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they they, they both have an eternal. One of his earliest poems refers to, uh, but. Um, you know, they both have this afterlife. They both have a kind of saint, a kind of saintliness to them. And I and I would like to come back to this very interesting point post um, post the coup attempt in 2016. Is that it seems it seems that the current government is very consciously trying to appropriate these symbols, much in the way that I think um, political scientists would would agree that that they have occupied this, the state in some ways. You know, it's sort of Turkey has become a one-party state in some ways, and. You know what's left? Are these, you know, so you can go after. You know, the first time I was very shocked to see these pictures of 
You know, Ataturk with his Kalpak, you know, used to be a very kind of nationalist symbol, but being carried by somebody who was holding, holding a flag that said La La La La La, religious Kalpak. You know, together. I mean, so there, there was a way in which he was being suddenly rewritten as a, a kind of religious leader. Yeah, like you know, so so and then Hikmet is also vulnerable to that kind of thing. So. <laughs> It's a, it's a sort of very contested landscape, I think, for both of them. There is one interesting thing about after the War of Independence, Igbet was put to jail. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a kind of marriage of convenience. Well, that was Igbet's one. I mean, he was a national, I mean, he kind of essentially, I, I don't think he was. Well, well this was, I mean, not only this poem, but if you read his early poems, which are not translated into English, I mean, he's like, you know, the blood of the fatherland. I mean, you know, he's like over the top na a nationalist. I mean, in that, in those early, before he was like, you know, maybe up until 21. He was consistently anti-imperialist. Anti-imperialist, But, but, but, yeah. But the first book, what's the title? The discussion is very, uh, it's a very beautiful topic. Let's, um, coming to the reception now? Okay, okay. So our, all our panels will be around afterwards. Please approach them with a question. Well, I'm sure they'll be continuing amongst themselves. Uh, I think it's yeah, thank you. Oh, this was definitely too short for me. I can listen to you all all day long, but we are getting hungry dinners there, so let's. Uh, save a couple of final words, uh, and then please, uh, hopefully we can continue the discussion after, um, while having dinner. Well, thank you so much, all the panelists. <laughs> Looks like the discussion still continues. <laughs> I hope so. Maybe next year we will talk. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we are almost there. And I would like to continue our program. It's my honor to introduce my colleague and my friend, Ken George. Town of Kerry, the councilman. Uh, he and I serve on the Sister Cities board as well. And I'm so happy that he's here with one of our exchange programs, um, French culinary students visiting. We are honored with that. And I just would like to give a brief introduction to my friend and honorable Ken George. Uh, he's a council member, District D. He has been serving Kerry residents since 2015. He's a long time uh, Kerry resident. I know I'm a, a bear witness for that. He and his wife, uh, we have been uh, working in many projects before he became a councilman. And he's a graduate of Kerry High School and obtained his bachelor's degree from North Carolina State University. So. Go walk back. <laughs> now, um, he uh, is the president and founder of NetSmart, and with that, I'd like to introduce him, and we appreciate his support for many years, not only for this Nazanik and Poetry Festival, but Children's Day Festival. He and his wife, um, Karen, came and helped us for many years with the culinary students, and it's, uh, we are happy to have him today. I think I could have, uh, would rather listen to them than, than speak here, so, uh, so I'll be brief. I actually have some kind of formal remarks. I do want to welcome you on behalf of Kerry and the, the council. I thought this thing was really too, too hot. Um, get the volume down just a little bit. I don't loud enough. I probably don't need it. Um, but based on uh, what I just heard from the discussion and a little bit I've gleaned over the last three years of here at this festival, um, I would like to say how important this theme, so I'm going to go off script, okay, I made notes, <laughs> uh, of the multiculturalism, the pro-multiculturalism that we have uh, at work here in Cary. It is so exciting, and, and for somebody who grew up here, went to Cary Elementary, 
and Cary High School when Cary had 2,000 residents, and there's been 160,000 more people join us through the years, some of which are from birth, obviously, uh, but some of them moved in. One of 18 people in Cary were born in a foreign country. Now, I went to Boston for a, a year ago and heard how Boston bragged they had one, 40% of Boston had one or both parents born in a foreign country. I think we've got to exceed that because think of all the foreigners that have had children here and then the people whose parents were born in a foreign country. I think we've got to exceed that in, in Cary, um, but we don't have numbers on that. I think the, and this idea of, of the overlapping of maybe two ideals because we are a, we're a nonpartisan town council. And, and we overlap ideals all the time. We, we completely, we look at what's best for Carrie rather than being ideologues. And that's the, the mark of our council. And it, it's nice that we're not, uh, I mean, you can look up anybody's party affiliation, but I find it hard for you to, to listen to a town council meeting and figure that out because it's all about Carrie. Um, I'd like to commend the American Turkish Association in a special way because I've been involved with the Sister Cities Association since 1989 when I was appointed by then Mayor Coca Booth. Uh, for those of you that know about the theater, yes, there is a person named Coca Booth that's named after him. Um, is that, that we have lots of, of cultural activities that go on in Cary. And if you look at a lot of cultural activities in Cary, they're they're open, and I'll, I'll just be open and honest with you here. A lot of them are, are for that particular culture, and then those of us that have an, int an outside interest. But that's uh, predominantly, you, you look just across the board, we've got lots of, of, of cultural groups. Well, what the American Turkic Association has done in association with the sister cities is put on this Children's Day Festival, which on, on April 21st, which you will see children from all different cultures participating. And what, what warms my heart and what makes me excited about being part of Cary, because I participate in all these things and, and have for years gone to many different cultural things, what I would like to see is the total cross-section of Cary participating in all these different cultural activities. So that when we have the um, the Dragon Boat Festival, or we, we have Diwali, or we have the Latino uh, group meeting downtown, or Black History Month, or MLK Weekend, that, that we all participate because we're all in this together. And we're all part of the multicultural uh, society. And that, that that's just one of my dreams and goals. And I, I was on the MLK celebration group this past year. And one of the reasons I was on that is because I grew up here. When I was in Cary in elementary school, the schools were segregated, and then they were integrated. And then as a fifth grader, my mom was teaching sixth grade, and she was uh, helping, uh, teaching in Carroll Elementary, and I would go, I went to ride home with her instead of the bus, so I would go after school, I had to wait for her to finish. And she had me help Clifford uh, with his math. I was a fifth grader, Clifford was in sixth grade. But Clifford was black, and Clifford came from a segregated school, and it was separate but not equal. And I learned in fifth grade it was separate but not equal. And, and that's the kind of multiculturalism, that's the kind of, uh, of approach that we all need to have toward each other and toward these uh, communities because we all did not come from the same background. We're all not at the same place. We may not be the same place education-wise or, or, or economic-wise, but. Uh, we're in this together in Cary, and we're here to make it a better place and for our kids to be proud of us and have a great place for our kids to be raised and grow up in. So that's all script. I hope that doesn't uh, offend anybody. Uh, but it's really important to me that, uh, that we give kudos to the American Turkish Association for events like this. And that, uh, that's all. Come out on April 21st to Bond Park for that. So you can get more information. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, again, it's an honor to be part of uh, Town of Kerry, and I completely agree. We cannot develop um, 
understanding and appreciation without actually feeling, observing different cultures. So it's, um, it's great that we are able to provide these platforms for these cultural exchanges. Um, a final, very short poem in Turkish and in English. And before that, I forget, many thanks to all the volunteers again. And I did forget to mention, how is this Nazım portrait? And uh, you know, Pelin, is Pelin here? Well, she is the one at the beginning, I mentioned that she, was, she had the idea of having the competition, serving the prize. Actually, she's, she's a database engineer, computer scientist, but she's also our artist. So that is her artwork. By the way, uh, yes. Uh, again, here she is. Here she is. Here she is. Here she is. Here she is. Here she We are going to read uh, this poem. We heard about Nazim almost entire afternoon, how revolutionist, how humanist, how all the political sides, but we wanted to finish up uh, with one of the love poems that he has written. He has written so many love poems to, to the woman in his life, and this is one of them. She's going to read English First, so when you listen to the Turkish, you will have a little bit of an idea what I'm talking about. And the poem is called Seviyorum Seni in Turkish, I love you. I love you, like dipping bread into salt and eating, like waking up at night with a high fever and drinking water with the tap in my mouth, like unwrapping the heavy box from the postman, with no clue what it is, fluttering, happy, doubtful. I love you, like flying over the sea in a plane for the first time. Like something moves inside me when it gets dark softly in his thumb. I love you, like thanking God that we live. Ağzımı dayayıp musluğa su içer gibi. Ağır posta paketini neyin nesi belirsiz telaşlı, sevinçli, kuşkulu açar gibi. Seviyorum seni. Denizi ilk defa uçakla geçer gibi. İstanbul'da yumuşacık kararırken ortalık içinde kapalıyan bir şey gibi. Seviyorum seni. Yaşıyoruz. Çok şükür der gibi. Discussions uh, during the reception, and uh, as I said last year, next year's uh, festival is going to be planned starting now. And I heard Whitman, great idea, maybe we will honor him next year. And I would like to finish by saying, To live like a tree, alone and free, like a forest in brotherhood. Thank you.